business? Very, very good uh, turnouts. 
So over the last two years, last year we pulled in just over ten thousand dollars for groups in our community, and uh, yeah, then uh, we were really surprised ourselves that it took off that well and went it went quite well. So um, we think it's a great opportunity, and we're going to continue. We're going to meet again this year in the spring, and we're going to narrow it down to one event per year. We found two was a little bit much. Um, for us and for the groups to get their proposals in. Proposals are quick, they're five minutes. We take as many proposals as come in. We have um, a little bit of a, what do you say, uh, areas of, of interest for sure, whether it's health or addictions or education or youth or families, but quite often those uh, proposals fit into numerous areas. And we just want uh, to make our community a better place for everybody. So that's, I think, what you need Yeah, come ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay, also we do want to, to say that the council has supported us uh, by having their staff, and thank you very much for that, accept and hold the donations. So the donations are $100 per person, or as many as they give, but it's $100 gets you one vote. And uh, uh, we get uh, the people who donate then get tax receipts issued. So you're serving as our uh, organization that uh, allows us to have those receipts issued to the people who donate. So we have set a date for our um, next event, and that is October 22nd of 2019. And we are requesting that uh, the um, council uh, support, Mayor and Council support um, having the same format for us this year. That And as I say, we uh, are very appreciative to the staff who have allowed this to happen and to the previous um, support in the decision to do that. So as Kim said, um, our areas of focus are uh, health and addictions, um, families, seniors, and youth, and youth and youth initiatives. And we accept proposals from local groups under those um, elements. And uh, then, as I say, the people who donate get a vote, and uh, the presentations are made, and the decisions are made locally. So it's local uh, initiatives, local money, and local decision making. And. Uh, in all, in our two events last year, we held our first one in March, and then we held our last one at the end of November. In the March one, we had five presentations from local groups, and the group that received the dollars by the vote was the Chapman Outdoor Society, and that was to support them in their efforts to establish the Nordic Center. And I have to say again, that money proved to be very significant see money and it allowed us to apply for a lot of other grants and um, the group gave a presentation and updated us on their activities to date at the November meeting. And then in uh, um, November we had three groups present and the group that uh, got the number of most votes was the Moberly Lake Elementary School in their efforts to build a uh, playground. And it is um, the case that that playground serves the entire Moberly Lake community. So while it's at the school, it does receive a lot of use from the community in uh, the area. So we do have our representatives from the school today and uh, I'm just, um, I think that the check will be presented to them for uh, um, the proceeds that we receive from the donations. So we have the principal, Annalie Duncan, and we have two student representatives, and they are Taya Long and Trinity Powell. And uh, they just come to uh, uh, express their appreciation and also to receive the dollars. That project also is a huge project, and this has uh, really set things in motion again than receiving those dollars. So thank you for your support to allow that to happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.
can we uh, can we uh, get the girls up and uh, just uh, mention the great the what grade they're they're in and uh, your teacher's name? Can you do that? With the mic, please. <laughs> there you go. Hi, I'm in grade five. My teacher's name is Miss Spear. And your name?
I I wouldn't I wouldn't think of putting my child in there. Yeah. So just so so. Well, I mean, that's entirely up to you. But if you're not expected to do it for free, and so I think that's why it was just to offer as a parent. Anybody.
action report. R81.
that our property then? I thought it was because I asked that question um, in the past and the garbage that's out there now, I believe, is being picked up by the district. There's garbage. Yeah. 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 It's very small. Yeah. And now the local board is ours. Oh, okay. And we may Should we be able to put Sally and uh, the workers to come up with something and bring it back to us? Well, I make the motion that staff and us be some of the opportunities and options. See what we can do for recycling. Okay. Second. Okay. Any more questions? Yeah. No, we're going to build a federal government for them. Because I don't think we should clean it up there fast. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. 
Testing. 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 Hey, it's Lee Wysobolski with Book Talk at Pine Tree Books, and I have Judy. And can you say your name so I don't make a mistake? Kacerik. Kacerik. It's a yeah. good Polish name. Yes, Well, you it know is. what? She's written a book called Naked Tuesday, and she does an article in the Mirror and Alaska Highway News called The Green-Eyed Girl. Mm -hmm. Plus, she's on CBC. She's everywhere. I try to be, She's yes. everywhere. Except well, on Tuesdays. We don't want to do stuff on Tuesdays. Okay. Did yeah. you actually go nude all day on Tuesday? Uh, well, that's just, you'd have to read the book to find out. Oh. Well, let's go back to... When you started writing, mm -hmm. when did you start writing? I have written for years and years and years. Um, I, I think, it was it was just something I enjoyed. I, so I would you know pen poems or I would I would write uh, in a journal, you know that kind of thing. And uh, then I would share it with my parents, and they would laugh, and people would give me that feedback that I needed. But I didn't really start writing and submitting them anywhere until. Uh, early on in my marriage, I started writing and I wrote primarily about uh, two characters called Eddie and Clarence, which were modeled after my father and my husband about their uh, escapades as they were hunting. So I started writing and submitting it to like outdoor life and places like that. So, yeah. yeah. And you grew up in? Uh, I was born in Fairview okay. and I grew up in a small town called Worsley, Alberta. So you're a northern girl. I am a northern girl. I am a northern farm girl. And you mentioned a little bit earlier that you moved to Vancouver Island. What prompted that and how did it impact your life? Well, my father had a massive heart attack at the age of 39. And uh, as a result of that, he had open heart surgery. I believe it was triple bypass. And I think at that point, he realized that the farm was a little bit more than he could um, you know, handle. I think there was that mortality thing where it's like maybe I'm not going to make it, maybe I'm not going to live for too many years. So uh, we sold the farm wow. and he sold his business, which was water truck hauling, and, and uh, sold his plane. He was a private pilot wow. as well. And, and we uprooted and moved down to Vancouver Island. And let me tell you, it was a hard transition for this this farm girl. I was 13 years old at the time, so it was really difficult, very difficult. And did you miss home? I did miss home. I, I'm a I'm an extrovert. If you can't, <laughs> it's yeah. easy to tell. But and so I love people and I love new experiences. But to 
to realize that I was a 13 year old girl who had lived on a farm all my life. I think I mentioned earlier, you know, you don't, you know, haircuts were done by the neighbor. Uh, you know, you played in fields, you snowmobiled, you did all those kinds of things and you were very isolated and very protected. And so then moving to Vancouver Island where they had, I mean, I know this sounds ridiculous, but all the roads were paved mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, and I, the school was huge and I was now a very small fish in a very big pond whereas when I was in school in Worsley I was a much larger fish in a very small pond. And when did you start writing? Did you start writing in Vancouver Island? Uh, no, I didn't. I think uh, during my time living on Vancouver Island I really struggled to try to meet these new expectations of living where I was living. I wasn't used to a lot of the way of life there. I, um, you know, I, I struggled with how to fit in and as a result I, I became very, very, very depressed and uh, I talk about it, I speak to it in my TED talk, our TEDx talk that I did last year but I actually, at the age of 14, had a, an unsuccessful suicide attempt. And so I think at that point it was very evident that I was struggling. Mm -hmm. What pulled you out of this? Um, what pulled me out of it? Well, I don't think you're ever totally pulled out of that type of thinking. I think people who suffer from depression deal with it um, all throughout their lives and, and have to battle the ups and downs. Uh, but we did move. <laughs> we moved and uh, we moved to Dawson Creek when I was in grade 11. And uh, I was much closer to that bosom of reality that I was so comfortable with. And, uh, and, and it was good for me. Excellent. And uh, it, it, it's kind of interesting because um, just the weather in the island sometimes gets to you too. Yeah, for my father, uh, the weather got to him. Yeah. Uh, he hated the rain, you know, missed the peace country sunshine. Mm -hmm. You can't ever get enough of the huge skies. And down there, it's a little different. I did love the weather. I loved everything about when I smell cedar trees, uh, when we get, we're going on holidays and I smell it, I, I feel nostalgic. But, but it just wasn't, it wasn't a good fit for me. And as a it wasn't a good fit for my father either because it drove him stir crazy. And he uh, ended up you know, realizing he wasn't gonna die. And uh, he got a job uh, working in the oil field. So. so in Dawson Creek, you started your penmanship. Yeah, and it was still for the for a time. I think I wrote, but I didn't write with purpose. You know, I I dabbled. I I but you I like didn't have humor. A, yeah, I love. Yeah, I like yes. I like sarcasm. I like I like when people don't think take things too seriously. And uh, and I think I like to take dark subjects and make them humorous as well, or subjects where people. Uh, are struggling with something, whether it be aging or parenting or ha relationships, and make them humorous. Yeah. Do you have any characters that you bring out? No, no. Do you have I, lots of them. I, I don't have characters now. I write from right from. It's about me, and it's about. So it's you about, are the character. I am the character, and my husband Bob is also a character in it as well. As much as he may not uh, enjoy that, <laughs> he does. He doesn't mind. But I got away from this Eddie and Clarence stuff that I was writing, and I realized that I could put my own name on things that I write. Still very hesitant about what I was sharing mm -hmm. necessarily, not quite knowing who my audience was at that point, but still I didn't have characters anymore. I became that character. Excellent. So yes, humor writing mm -hmm. and um, do you do that on CBC? I haven't heard it mm -hmm. for a while. Mm -hmm. Every two weeks, right? Every two weeks, yeah. And on, is there a set day? Yeah, at 7.40 on Thursdays, yeah. So in the morning. This, yeah, so not tomorrow, or not, is it Thursday today? Yeah, yeah. Ooh, you, you so on. it's next week, yeah, oh, next okay. week, yeah. Okay, and so the topics you pull from Dawson Creek and yourself. Well, what I do is I, I speak to relatable topics that would be relatable to talk to people in the peace region or try to draw a correlation there, you know, because we're unique, we're different, we're What makes us different? Like, so, tell uh, us a little mm, bit about that. I think that our uh, our work ethic makes us different. Do you our, think we work harder? I think we, 
Ooh, I think we do. I think we do. We work differently. Let's put it yeah, that we way. We work differently. You know, I speak to the fact that, you know, my husband and my son are both in the oil field and, and uh, they're uh, gas operators and, you know, they are working at 35 below mm -hmm. and they are up and out of the house and, and, and gone, as are many individuals mm -hmm. in this area. So, I think we work really hard. You know, we have truck drivers who are on the roads in inclement weather. We have farmers who are, you know, working so, so very hard to, and so I do, I, I think we work differently, not to diminish yeah. uh, anything else, but I do. S something that I, I'm just wondering about, and I really like your opinion, do you think that some of the people that are in service industries and farmers have a resentment towards um, pipeliners and oil and gas people mm. because of the salary? What, what do you think of that? Mm. A resentment? Or a uh, jealousy? I don't know. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. um, when you speak to a farmer, yeah. uh, as my father was a farmer, uh, he said, I remember him joking, saying, give me a million dollars. If I won the lottery, I would just farm it until it was gone. It's farming is in their blood. They love it. I, I don't think that you, although you have to be able to survive at yeah. farming, um, I do think that there's a passion for it. And, and farmers are unique individuals and they, they, they have a different, they have a very uh, different value system. And it's, it's all about that home life. So, so um, in, in the big picture of things, um, I'm just wondering, uh, would you, are you going to continue living in Dawson Creek and writing? Yes, I think so. Like my husband, born and raised in Dawson Creek. We have a daughter in um, Edmonton and our son lives in Dawson Creek as well. And my parents live there and my oh, siblings sure. have all yeah. um, moved back there. So I'm surrounded by family and friends. And, you know, the thing about it is at the end of the day, I know that I can come home to this very the warm loving arms of the peace country. I, I can, and I can go away, I can, I can go on holidays, I can go speaking engagements and that kind of thing. But at the end of the day, I, I can come home to this place that I do call home. Excellent. Now, are you planning on a second book? Yes, yes I am. I am, and actually the, it was funny because I was going to write about my experience working for an airline because I worked for a regional airline for eight, eight years. And I thought, oh, there were so many stories that I could tell. But it, you know, when I took pen to paper or mm -hmm. fingers to keyboard, it didn't, it didn't come out that way. It came out with a continuation of the type of stories mm -hmm. that I was writing in Naked Tuesday. Yeah, so um, how far along are you on your second book? I'm almost done. I'm wow. almost done. I, I just need uh, to not procrastinate and just get it finished and get it into editing. Could you tell us the name of the new book? That's what's killing me, is that uh. I need, I, I have been struggling with a name, like with a really great name. You know, Naked Tuesday was and is, I think, a great title for a book. But I want my next book to have that same, because it, it ha does have the same flavor, I want it to be as, I don't know, as kind of perky and, and not naughty, because I'm not a naughty sassy. person. Sassy. I want it to be sassy. Yeah. Who is this written for specifically? Do you have an audience mm -hmm. that you could say, you have to read this book or you're crazy? Well, I have found that uh, wives have read it to their husbands on road trips and uh, and that kind of thing and they've loved it. I think my demographic, so like I said, I was, I'm 52 right now, but I've found that everybody from the age of 30 to 65 finds it relatable because uh, I do, I don't pull any punches. I tell you exactly how it is. You know, if I fall down, I tell you how I felt da fell down, how it happened, you know, how funny it was and, you know, I, I, I try to be relatable, I'm real. Mm -hmm. Well, it's really proud that a Dawson Creek person now um, has written it. Have, what's the response from the general audience that have read it? Really, really positive. I, I, I get tweets from people who, you know, I remember somebody sent, said, uh, said to me, it's pee my pants funny. I don't know if I'm allowed to say pee my pants, but pee my pants funny. And, and it really, it, it's been very, I think humbling, you know, because you don't think when you write something that it's going to be that, 
uh, that it's going to have that kind of response. So it's been really humbling. Who would you compare your writing style to? Oh, well, some of my favorite authors are people like Jen Lancaster. She wrote a book called Bitter is the New Black. Um, uh, the blog S, Jenny Lawson, uh, I think I really enjoy her writing as well. Uh, Sia Sunrise Pearson, I don't, she's a phenomenal writer uh, and I love the way that she tells her stories. So those are, would I compare myself to them? No, I mean they're they're amazing authors, but I do pull from from you know I'm influenced by them greatly. Yeah. Good. So what's going to happen today is you're going to be leaving some books at Pine Tree Books. Yes, I and am. And we're going to be having a major major book show, and I may invite you to come in and, yes. and do a little reading of lovely. your favorite favorite spot, mm -hmm. and we'd like to highlight your new book okay. right from the start. Thank Maybe you. we can beat. CBC. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Judy. Thank you. In Canada's Banff National Park, census takers on horseback. They're counting noses in the annual survey of animals in this wildlife sanctuary. And they discover old citizens and new ones, like this bighorn sheep and her lamb. The park warden who's making the census tempts the mother sheep to come closer for a snack. But the lamb isn't too sure about the stranger. They're incredibly nimble and sure-footed, these mountain sheep, Using footholds little more than an inch wide, they can scamper up steep rock faces 50 feet high. Bears are numerous in the park, and they too are checked by the survey. The purpose of the census is to make sure the balance of nature is being maintained. If one species is multiplying too quickly for the available food, some may have to be killed to lessen the possibility of disease and overgrazing. Other animals may need special protection to prevent their dying out. Stand up and be counted. This young coyote pup doesn't seem to want to cooperate. Many of the animals aren't too easy to find unless you know where to look. Here are deer twins sleeping peacefully and oblivious of the inquisitive man from the government. But their mother is close by and she keeps a watchful eye open. Pausing now and then, the warden jots down his findings. Most of the animals in the park, like these buffalo, generally stick to the same areas. And so it's possible to make accurate estimates of their population. Sometimes on his rounds, the census man does a good turn. Here's a baby elk wandering around without its mother. It must be an orphan, so it needs special attention, even though it may resist at first. But soon its troubles will be over. The warden knows the family status of most of the animals in his care. He remembers seeing a mother elk who had lost her calf. Maybe she will accept this one as a replacement. There, in a clearing, is the mother elk. The shy, orphaned calf is introduced to her, and they hit it off perfectly. And so they simply adopt each other. Besides using horse and truck, the warden has a boat to help him get around the huge park. Here, he's on the lookout for moose, and it doesn't take him long to find some. They're excellent swimmers and they eat underwater vegetation as well as twigs and shrubs.
Observations ashore and afloat show the warden that many of the cow moose have calved since he was last around. And he notes it all down as part of the annual census at Banff National Park. Energetic and continuous conservation measures make sure that there will always be plenty of animals in this picturesque wildlife sanctuary. A truckload of something very special arrives at Hastings Elementary School, Vancouver. And there's no shortage of helpers when it comes to the unloading. They've been waiting for this for days now, thought it would never come. But it's here at last, a whole collection of animal visitors from Stanley Park, one of Canada's most famous zoos. And the zoo's curator, Alan Best, has come along to explain these strange creatures, like the springy little wallaby from Australia. What a wonderful way to have a natural history lesson. Here's a toucan with its great big bill, a weapon and a scoop for food. And here's a penguin, a bird in evening dress. At first the children were wary of the animals, but now they can't get close enough to examine and pet them. Even the weird looking giant anteater doesn't frighten them. He's a highly specialized fellow, this, with a long tongue perfectly adapted to eating ants. The zoo can't supply the half million ants he needs every day, so they've taught him to enjoy dog food and milk. And the youngsters are fascinated as Mr. Best shows them how sharp nature has made the anteater's claws so he can rip open ant hills. You'd think snakes would horrify the children. But Mr. Best explains that these two baby rock pythons, five and eight feet long, aren't a bit poisonous. And it isn't long before a brave girl volunteers to wear one as a necklace. Nothing to it, really. Now everybody wants a wriggly handful of python to play with. The children find it not only great fun, but also a memorable lesson. For there's nothing like first-hand contact to give a better understanding of the strange beings that inhabit the Earth. So it's with reluctance that they go back to their ordinary classes. But maybe there'll be another animal day before too long. About half a million dogs live in Greater Montreal, and at least that many cats. Every few minutes, somewhere in the city, someone's pet tries to cross a busy street, and sometimes the attempt to brave the traffic ends in disaster. There's no need to stand around and watch helplessly when a quick telephone call to the SPCA will bring one of their mobile patrol vans to the rescue. This time, he's not hurt too badly, but he needs emergency attention and the animal ambulance won't lose any time taking him to headquarters where he can get it. The mobile units cover every part of Canada's largest city. Almost every day, some cat, out of curiosity or chased by a dog, finds itself up a tree and unable to get down. Another emergency, but it's just routine for the Canadian Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Besides dealing with accidents, the society operates a clinic providing free treatment for the pets of those who can't afford to pay. And the variety of patients is endless. There's nothing sadder than a sick dog. Last week he was frisky and full of life. Now he's listless and drowsy, off his feed. Animals suffer from almost as many diseases as humans, but fortunately, many can be cured, and some can be prevented. The dog's most deadly enemy is distemper. Once caught, it's hard to cure, but it can be prevented by vaccination. The SPCA urges that all city dogs be vaccinated early. This one wasn't, and examination quickly confirms the vet's suspicions. There's nothing the vet can do but tell the family 
they are about to lose a faithful friend. There are happier scenes at the SPCA, especially when a boy comes in to adopt a new dog. Thousands of stray or unwanted dogs, cats, and other pets end up at the society's shelter every year. Those that aren't claimed by their owners may be bought for just $5. For boy and dog alike, a very satisfactory arrangement. The only problem is making a choice. Yes, now I'm sure. That's the one I want, not the big one. The little fellow, he's just got to be mine. What should I call him? Does he have a name already? Maybe Spot or Butch. That's it, Butch. But just a minute, suppose they aren't bringing me the right one. I want Butch, the little brown one. Yes, that's the one. And so, boy meets dog, and Butch gets a new master who has promised to look after him well, following the advice of the SPCA. He'll brush and comb him regularly and provide a comfortable bed, plenty to eat and drink, and lots of healthy exercise. Life can be hard for a dog in the city, but not if he has a good master. So, Butch and his master begin a new friendship thanks to the SPCA, which for more than a century has been devoted to making life better for every kind of animal.